this year, Dr. Louts, Dr. Jessica Louts, um, Deputy Chief Economist with the National Association of Realtors, actually presented for us the top nine real estate trends to watch in 2023. We are thrilled to have her back to provide an, up, an economic update um, and a state of the industry report. So please welcome uh, Dr. Jessica Louts, who is Zooming in. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you so much for having me today. I am going to hope that you all can see my screen and see me and hear me okay. Um, let me know if that is not the case, but otherwise I'm going to uh, zoom right in. We are in a very unusual uh, point in the housing market. I would say that um, in your area, you're probably doing uh, better than what we are seeing in some areas of the country. Um, in some areas of the country, we are seeing uh, price declines, uh, softening of home prices. Um, we are still seeing uh, strong demand for uh, southern states, the Sun Belt areas. Uh, migration flow is still happening um, into your area. So I suspect that you're in a slightly better boat uh, than, say, folks who are in Austin or Boise. Um, those are areas, uh, as well as California, where we're seeing uh, strongest price declines around the country. As we jump into the data, uh, this is the latest and greatest that was released in the last week uh, from NAR. This is from our existing home sales and our Realtors Confidence Index. So I wanted to show you the latest and greatest uh, to start out with. And what we can see here is that the spring market does seem to be rebounding. Uh, we do have 3.3 offers for every home that's listed. This is the latest data that we have. Um, you know, when we look at this, we can see so, some differences here. One on the good side is that we're actually above the historical norm. The historical norm is 2.4 to 2.5, depending on whether you're taking the average or the median, when we look at the number of offers out there for every home that's listed. So we're actually stronger than what, what the historical norm would be. If we look at this in comparison to last spring, though, we can see that we're down. Now, last spring, of course, interest rates were about ready to go up. Consumers had locked in a lower interest rate with their lender, and so they were ready to actually jump. And they were making very competitive offers, waiving the contingencies just to get into that perfect home. And so we know that this is a very different market in comparison to last year. But I don't necessarily with a help healthier market that was less healthy as we think about the competitiveness and not only um, barely seeing a home if you did physically see it, but really having to make such an aggressive offer above the list price of that home. All of that said, right now, 3.3 offers is still very strong. The vast majority of homes moving under a month. Uh, days on market are actually back down to teens, which is uh, very low. Um, and we do see that a section of the market is actually still moving above the list price. So closer to a third um, of homes are still moving above the list price. So we do know that this multiple offer situation is back. This is really due to limited inventory. Um, we have give or take on a monthly basis about a million homes in the marketplace right now. If we look at this, before the pandemic, so a few years ago, we had 2 million homes in the market. At that time, we were still saying we don't have enough housing inventory. So when we think about we have just more people in this country, we have more millennials trying to find a home, we know that we don't have enough housing inventory. And I'm going to talk a little more about that. So I'm going to leave that there for a second. The next one, when we look at the indicators today, is this vacation home buyer small investor share. And there's a lot of overlap here. So I combine these two numbers because someone who Airbnbs the property, but they're vacationing in the property, are they an investor or are they a vacation home buyer? Well, both. And so when we look at this share, what we can see now is it's back down to the norm. And that's certainly a good thing for potentially first-time buyers who want to enter into the market, retirees who could have been competing with these home buyers. On the bad side, though, we do see if you are one of those first time home buyers or working with those first time home buyers out there, rather, what we would see is that we still have a lot of all cash home buyers. 25% uh, of the marketplace is paying all cash. This is higher than the historical norm. If we look at what we can say, is that we may have been trying down a little bit from 28%, but still we're trending higher than the historical norm. 
teens in a summer. Um, the highest point that we've ever recorded is 35%. So we're not there. Uh, but we are trending higher. And what does that mean exactly? Well, if we have these competitive offers, if we see a uh, multiple offer situation, obviously that all cash offer is going to be quite attractive to that potential seller likely to go with that offer instead. Who are these people? Well, we know that half of older boomers and uh, a substantial share of silent generations, smaller pool of buyers, uh, are actually paying all cash for this home. So looking at half of older boomers and the biggest generation of home buyers today, paying all cash means that there's a lot of all cash buyers. Looking at this share, we know home owner today does have approximately uh, $190,000 in housing equity after being in their home for a decade. So we can see that that buyer, if they're moving to a more affordable location, is either able to put down a substantial down payment or pay all cash for that home. The other thing that I think is really important to note right now is distressed sales. Just don't see them in the marketplace. It's at 2% right now. Um, if we look at this back in 2009, the peak was at 49% of the market. Um, I will say that every time it goes from 1% to 2%, and it, you can see it bounces around uh, quite a bit there on a monthly basis, 1% to 2%, I see headlines that say 100% increase. Yeah, sure. That's a fact, but also we have to remember this is single digits, low single digits of realtors who are working with a distressed seller. So we're just not seeing that that much. And again, if we talk about that housing equity that the typical homeowner has, even if there was something unfortunate to happen in something in someone's life, that homeowner, they likely would be able to move to their next home or to temporarily rent or to move in with families and still actually leave with housing equity. So likely wouldn't be in a scenario where they would have to unfortunately sell their home and, and couldn't make up that loss. I, I know that you've seen this slide before. If you've heard me present, I'm just going to hone in on this again because we just did a survey and I heard, I saw the data again, and it still is showing that consumers are expecting home prices to drop. We have to get the word out, y'all. We have to talk about the tight inventory that we see, that that's going to continue pushing up home prices, that this is a different environment. It's not 2009. It's not 2008. Uh, we have really tight lending standards. It's hard to get a mortgage today. And again, the demographics, we see this massive amount of millennials who are entering into the real estate market at the same time that seniors are active and they're healthy later in life and they're they're staying in their homes for longer periods of time, uh, their primary residents not moving into nursing homes. And so as we see all of these themes converge, we know that this really is a problem in the real estate market today. And that's what's pushing home prices up in many areas of the country, not universal, but in most areas of the country, we are seeing home prices gain. I want to talk a little bit about built for rent. Honestly, I, I dug into this data yesterday, um, playing around with census data. I got a question uh, in from a reporter, and frankly, I didn't know the answer. And so I wanted to dig into it and actually uh, look at this. I will say I've already sent my slides over as a PDF uh, to Karen so that you all can get them. Um, but this one doesn't have a citation at the bottom yet, just because it's going to go up today. So you all are getting it before it's actually live this data that I found yesterday. Um, in looking at this, built for rent, the idea that a new single family property is going to be only on the rental market and that new single family property is not going to be for ownership has gone up and it's gone up pretty substantially. Now, a couple of things to say here. I have been asked about this quite a bit recently, which is really what motivated me to dig into this. And as we look at this jump, I want to give a couple couple points here. One, right now, we're looking at the thousands of units that were actually built um, as opposed to looking at the share. And I'm going to show you the share in a second here. But what we can see here is there is a growth. Um, if we think about multifamily buildings, so building apartment buildings, building uh, uh, units for people to rent for a temporary uh, period of time, what we know is that building had been down. It has come back into the marketplace. That being said, there's a lot of young adults who are being priced out of the market today, and they could be very much attracted to this single family product. Um, they may have a family, they may have a dog, all of the same reasons why someone would purchase a single family property is why they could be attracted to this, but they're having a hard time saving for that down payment. 
and entering a real estate market that is largely unaffordable to them. Um, as we think about both the rise in rates, the rise in home prices, that competition from all cash buyers, we know that those young adults are being left behind. And I'll show you a chart on that shortly. As we look at the share, though, the share of built to rent properties, this is where it becomes important too, as opposed to just the thousands of units. What we can see here is the share did grow in the last year from 5% to 8% of all single family properties that were built were built for rent. So that is a different type of product and that is the highest share reported by census. So I do think it is notable as we look at this, um, but we know that there are out for this product. There are later to see that in that as well. If we look at this on a regional basis, because all real estate is local, what we can see here is that the biggest growth was actually in the Midwest for this product. So now 12% of the product of, of single family homes that were built in the last year, um, both tied for the Northeast and the South at 8% and then the West at 7%. So some regional variation there um, as we look at this and, and where these homes are being built. I want to talk about longer moves. I suspect I talked about this to you all already, but I have dug into the data a little more. Um, so I want to show you the latest and greatest that I have here too. Um, Inbound move rates, still seeing strong inbound move rates in the last year into the Carolinas. Um, you all are just behind, uh, honestly, Texas and Florida. Uh, so very strong attraction to move there. Uh, affordability, quality of life, weather, every everything that you can think of, people are moving to those areas as well as job growth. Um, very attracted to there. Um, as we look at this, I know that people are looking for less dense areas. Uh, we are still seeing that to be quite popular. Um, as we look at the data on a monthly basis, we collect this in the Realtors Confidence Index. People are still looking outside of city centers. Um, it's actually ranging, uh, pretty tight range actually, but it, it's typically about 85% of the market is looking outside of a city center versus any city center to look for a home um, over the course of the last month. Also important when we look at this is the distance moved. Typically, buyers stayed pretty close to home, uh, moving just 10 to 15 miles from 1989 to 2021. In the last year, that did skyrocket. It went to 50 miles. Um, this becomes really important too, and I did dig into the data because I wanted to really understand that long distance mover in a different way. Uh, what we can actually see is that a quarter of all movers, one quarter of all movers actually moved about 475 miles. If we think about that, 475 miles, I promise you, I don't know a neighborhood 50 miles away from me and know that well, uh, but I also very much do not know even where 475 miles is away from me right now either, um, and I certainly would not know that neighborhood. The reliance on the realtor, the reliance on your local expertise becomes even more important in this scenario as that home buyer does not know that local area. They're relocating in a way that they, that's just not something that they know. Even if they have friends and family, even if they vacationed there, you are that local expert. And so being that guiding light is incredibly important. What I also found when I dug into that data is that those long distance movers, those who are relocating about 475 miles or more, are actually more likely to use an agent. They are more likely to find that agent online. So thinking about how you're putting your profile out there, how you're putting that on social media. If you're working with a lot of long distance movers, moving from say the DC area, for instance, uh, thinking about that information that you are putting out there so that they can find you and find your local expertise. The other thing that we know that relates to this as well is just looking at people who did not physically see that home before they actually moved into that property. We're still seeing that at 8% of the marketplace, pretty substantial, I would say, um, is seeing people who did not physically walk through that home before they, they had that under contract. Um, I think this is important as we think about the evolving real estate market, how technology is going to play a role here, how it's pretty constant. All right, a few slides on generational warfare. The latest and greatest data released this spring. Um, I will say it's not super great news, so I probably should switch out that photo for millennials um, as we look at this. So U.S. population overall, little pandemic babies born in the last year in green. Um, as uh, people age, we just don't see that many people making it past, like, say, 100. So you can see the bars get shorter here. All right, two 
interesting, notable things, I think, a few interesting things um, on this. Uh, what we can see here is that in the blue, uh, this is the millennial generation. Uh, the median age of a first-time home buyer today is now 36 years old. That is the red bar. So that is older than we ever have seen before. It's also the smallest share of millennials who are of first-time home buyers in the marketplace that we've ever seen before as well. When we talk about the inventory crisis, I want you to take a look at just past that, those young 20s, young, young 30s rather, and, and late 20s, what we see here is this peak of young adults who are really trying to enter into the real estate market. And that becomes quite important as we think about the inventory crisis and the need for more building um, and the need for that. And we have seen that ramp up. We've seen a stronger share of home buyers into the new home buying sector because of the lack of inventory in the existing home sector, because people don't want to leave their low interest rate mortgages and they're just staying put. The other takeaways from this chart, too, is this yellow. What we can see here is the baby boomer generation um, in that sea of yellow, and the median age of your repeat buyer in the marketplace is 59 years old. When we started collecting this data back in 1981, typical repeat buyer was 36 years old. That's the age of our first-time home buyer today. So really a very big shift in home buying preferences as we think about those baby boomers, what they need from their home, how long they plan on being there. Uh, Gen Xers squeeze between the two of them. Smaller generation of buyers, pretty consistent though. Let's take a look at the share of all the home buyers. And this is where it becomes pretty unfortunate for millennials. Um, as we look at this, we've been doing this generational trends report since 2013. Over the course of eight years, millennials were the biggest generation of home buyers because they're the biggest generation of Americans. They're the blue. So as we see that, we saw that huge generation, how they really are bigger than all other generations out there. And we can see that they were the dominant generation in the home buying sector. In the last year, that dropped off. And instead, what has taken them over is baby boomers, that yellow. So continuing the colors throughout. Um, what we can see here is that they are now the biggest generation of home buyers. In the next three years, every single boomer is going to be over the age of 60. If they're not thinking about retirement, if they're not in retirement, they're going to be thinking about it soon and the retirement property that's going to fit their new needs. So this is a shift that we really are seeing here in dynamic. Gen Xers, that, that purple, they're pretty steady. You can see that their share right there. Also important to note is when we look at the green, the green of Gen Zers, they are the new buyers entering the market. They are 18 to 23 years old in the home buying market today, and they are new. They often have mom and dad's money as they come into the marketplace, but they are here. And so they're chipping away at that millennial share too, I suspect, uh, or really all shares. The first time homebuyer share, yes, it dropped to a historic low. It's at 26% of the marketplace today, really seeing a lot of challenges coming in, uh, saving for the down payment, portability, inventory, all of these being huge concerns um, as they enter into the marketplace. And last year, if we remember, we really did not know rental units out there. So we actually saw bidding wars in it for rental properties, people willing to pay more to their landlord uh, just to have that perfect rental property. I want to give you a few senior facts because they are so different. Uh, baby boomers are reinventing retirement. They're reinventing home buying too. Uh, they're moving very long distances. They are the most likely generation to be relocating that far distance away. They're not downsizing. They don't have any necessarily any intention of doing so. And smart home features and bells and whistles and all that kind of stuff, they'll absolutely go for it. Uh, they have the money to do so now, but they're not necessarily buying a smaller square footage as they're doing that as well. Uh, sometimes they're buying with roommates. I think this is pretty notable. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, they're looking for companionship and affordability in this scenario, and they're they're pooling their finances as they go into that, that home. Uh, Multi-generational buying is continuing to be a trend. Uh, we're seeing it at 14% of the marketplace. I think post-COVID, there's not really this attraction to think about nursing homes or assisted living. And so we do see that that continues to be a trend in the marketplace. Gen Xers, really the, the big purchasers of this, thinking about that sandwich generation of taking care of elderly parents and kids, kids over the age of 18, even kids under the age of 18, 
all within that single family home, perhaps uh, looking to find a bigger property to accommodate everyone. Uh, just a couple on the agent role. I just want to say uh, y'all are killing it out there. We're still seeing that agents are very attractive to buyers to use. Uh, they want an agent to help them navigate the market, negotiate the terms, especially when we see this multiple bid situation happening again. Uh, it becomes even more important for that buyer to have an agent by their side to get that ratified contract so they can move into their perfect home. Uh, we're really seeing that become quite important and stay quite important rather at 86%. Um, and we do see that sellers are using agents and the most common agent to use for sellers is a full service agent, one that provides all the bells and whistles. So pricing that home, staging the home, marketing the home, uh, fixing, telling them how to fix up my home for sale, everything that you can think of and doing it all within a specific time frame, getting them to that closing table. That's really what they want from their seller's agent. All right, that is all I have for you, um, but I have sent my slides over as a PDF, so hopefully they can be shared with you all if you need them or want them. Uh, do follow us on social media, and the new blog post on that Built for Rent is going to be up today as well. So thank you so much for having me.